Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in our chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey, everybody, got another episode of the Bitcoin podcast. Special midweek release we're dropping it on you guys because we love you and i admit that from the heart bottom of my heart we got um jeremy back on the show jeremy epstein welcome back thanks guys thanks for having me of course and so we didn't do our usual introduction my bad what's our usual I'm host number two d we don't do that we don't do that for well, we say we're our host. A, everybody knows who we are just start talking <laughs> Everybody okay. knows us. <laughs> well, um, shouldn't we do ads too? We should do the ads. We'll throw an ad or two in. It doesn't matter. Because we have to. Yeah, so um, we're brought to you by BetKing.io. It's a casino. They released ICO um, shares of themselves. Ooh, I bet they didn't like me saying that, but the SEC probably agrees with me. Right. Um, <laughs> um, it's they're a betting site. They're revamping you can the go betting on website. There and, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of card games, eventually. They got they got a beta you can go play yeah. a couple games with to bet some things with Bitcoin. They did a bunch of stuff earlier, shut down after they made a bunch of money. Now they're opening back up, make even more money. It's yep. gambling site. It's, go. It's crazy. <laughs> go bet. We're, um, we're also brought to you by um, Corn Pops, the golden-y, Pop. crunchy, sugary cereal. We're not. We're not. Um, what? Who else do we get sponsored by? I feel really irresponsible right Athena now Bitcoin. as a, a platform. Athena Bitcoin. That's right. Uh, my mom was wearing your shirt today, Athena Bitcoin. So she's like the Campbell's chunky soup of Bitcoin. Um, it's great. I'm going to take a picture put it on Twitter. Athena Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin most trusted Kyle. ATMs in the biz. Yep. What? Did you say something else? Bitquick, 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 Dio. Oh yeah, Bitquick, Dio. It's big. Yeah, it's big quick. Get your bits quick. It's a great jingle. You're welcome for that, big quick. Um, yeah. So look up those three things, everyone. And those, there are sponsors. Um, I wish Man, we done. should we should make like a commercial. We're done. We're done there. Let's move on. We're done with sponsors. Jeremy, I think you guys you can news. make like one comprehensive jingle. You know, like we one just, comprehensive jingle that has just, all your sponsors. We just in, have we just have really a song. Cool. We just make a song, and then every we change yeah. our sponsorships, the song changes. I like that idea. Yeah, That's and a, it's like it's like the Gil- <laughs> it's like the Gilligan's Island opening theme. Like here are three guys on the Bitcoin podcast, and like they're sponsored by A B C D, and like and like people know it, and you just interchange. It's like modular, but like everybody <laughs> knows the tune, and then it's just like it's like Actually, which companies we get dropped in that week. I actually love. I that actually kind of love that idea. <laughs> I love that we idea. need to brand the opening to the show because, like, I love you guys, but it was a little bit kind of choppy at the beginning of the show today. You know, just we need a little smooth. Your we, audience we, deserves better. We professionally we do, do that, that on all purpose the time, so yeah. that people feel like okay. we're just yeah. some guys <laughs> talking about stuff. That's a so that's a professional the maneuver. Authenticity is okay. 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 I I, I can live. The brand killing. has you're, like an authenticity. You're killing our professionalism, kind of, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> so you have some news. <laughs> you have some news, and we want you to talk about it. Tell us about your news. Yeah. So okay. So th- I'm very excited about this. I was up till four in the morning, and we just released um, a brand new ebook. It's totally free. We'll put it in the show notes. But Bitly slash uh, Blockchain MKTG for marketing. Capital B, capital M, Blockchain, capital M, marketing. MKTG. Uh, and basically, it's like 67-page book 
called the CMO Primer for the Blockchain World. Now, this is our effort. Like everyone who listens to this podcast is a believer in Bitcoin, believes in decentralization, believes in blockchain, or they're they, or maybe they got lost if they're listening back. But most people. So this is my effort to go to like the chief marketing officers of the world's biggest companies and be like, hey. This thing's real. You need to start paying attention because my goal in life, as I've shared with you, is to bring this world of decentralization to the present as quickly as possible. So we got a foreword from the chief marketing officer of NASDAQ. We have a foreword from the chief marketing officer of Dun & Bradstreet. And basically, these guys, they had two jobs. One was to say blockchains are important. And number two was Jeremy's not a total idiot. So fortunately, they did both of those. Um, but it's really a chance to say, OK, if you have a world of blockchain, Right. What does that mean for things like loyalty, advertising, you know, customer experience? Like, why do you need a CRM system if we all control our own identity? Right. So it's a pretty big undertaking. It's totally free. You can download it. Um, but it's really sort of my contribution to this, what I consider to be a larger cause to um, help advance this vision of a decentralized world by taking it to, you know, the largest companies and saying, hey, this is something you should take seriously. Here's why. And hopefully that will, you know, make us all better off um, soon. So I'm pretty excited about it. Obviously, I'm a little wired because I'm um, lack of sleep, but um, definitely would love appreciate people checking it out. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm just trying to throw some questions out there so we can all kind of understand this world that's coming our way pretty quickly. That that kind of takes me directly into a question that I've been meaning to ask you, but um, I never get to talk to you on these shows for whatever <laughs> reason. Um, and that is, you know. Marketing in crypto is kind of blah, and that's me being very like politically correct about it. So right. if you, using your expertise, could you give a scale from like zero to ten of where you think the state of marketing is just in general for all the companies that are involved in crypto, all the things they do, wallets, exchanges, all of them, where do you think they would stand – when it comes from like a marketing perspective on that yeah. scale? It's a great question. Actually, I, I put out a report last um, in May about this very topic, and I can share that with you too. Um, you know, I, I'd say it's getting better. Uh, I'd say that, you know, most so people. So nice. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to be thoughtful. And so my, my wife tells me I need to be more sensitive, so I'm working on it. Um, you know, she actually says I need to be a lot more sensitive, but one step at a time. Um, so, you know, look, the the bulk of the people in this space, as you guys know, are hardcore engineers, and they're not marketers. And and the problem for people when they hear the word marketing, most people like are like, ew, it's marketing, it's disgusting, because we're all sick and tired of like spam emails and bad advertising and blah blah blah. That's not really, I mean, that's marketing, but that's the second part. The first part is like we've talked about understanding who you're building this product for. Like, how is it going to differentiate from all the other things that are sort of people think of as similar out there. So I think there's the strategic level and then there's the implementation level. Um, I think the strategic level still needs a lot of work and that's kind of very common. So I'd say on that level, we're talking maybe like two or three um, on the kind of implementation, like, you know, the look and feel of these websites and stuff and stuff like that. You know, I'd say maybe four. What's interesting, like I just put up a post yesterday about Filecoin. They have an amazingly tight video that sort of, explains what they're trying to do in this grand scheme of things. I was like almost emotional watching it. Like it was really, really good. I saw this other company called Lampix, which they're building like this like AR lamp that you put on your desk and like it has this, I don't even totally understand it, but it creates this like augmented reality like systems on your tables. And I was like, that's a really slick video. Like, you know, it's like people are starting to pay more and more uh, attention to that. So Somewhere, somewhere, let's say on the average, let's call it three and a half, four, which is, you know, not unexpected for sort of this stage of development, I would say. Does that seem that, fair to you guys? That's exactly, okay, yes, that seems fair. And I want to make sure that I follow this up with the next question. That, like, I, As you were talking, this question bled into me is, like, what is, when can marketing become effective for a technology? Is it possible for there to be too much marketing if the, if the technology isn't, is too nascent? In terms of like how Bitcoin and blockchain currently works, the utility is 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 rather low compared to the amount of speculation in the entire field. So, 
is marketing only going to make the speculation worse because the utility isn't growing fast enough? Or will proper marketing help bootstrap or, or catalyze the, the things that are needed to make utilities larger and stronger? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, I mean, I'd almost say it's like D all of the above, but if you really want to take a step back, this is kind of crazy. I would almost argue, argue that Satoshi Nakamoto is a marketer, right? Because what basically Satoshi recognized, and when I was just reading in here, I have my, I'm holding up my copy of the Coin Center Bitcoin, you know, white paper, new little document. But if you go back to like basically <laughs> why he writes, what, what he wrote, you know, it's like, the world needs this peer-to-peer -peer system. We've basically been screwed by, you know, he, he sort of saw that we've been screwed by the banks. We had all these issues, the dangers of centralization. So basically, Satoshi recognized there is a need in the marketplace. And I'm going to serve that need by developing a new product to, to meet that need that I think is differentiated, that adds more incremental value. And the value proposition of Bitcoin is, you know, it's faster or sorry, it's it's definitely um, more secure. It's got, you know, hopefully lower transaction fees than even the traditional system or what have you, you know, less risk. It's peer to peer. You don't go to centralized, whatever. So all the things we know and love about Bitcoin, that's a value proposition. He basically is saying there's a need. I see how I'm going to build a product and now I'm going to put all this differentiated stuff. And instead of relying on centralized entities, I'm going to use this proof of work kind of you know, consensus algorithm. That's basically marketing. He may not have thought about it in those terms, but that's what great marketing is. So my answer is marketing is the very first thing that people should be doing because they're like, I'm going to build this product. Okay, why? Who's going to use it? Why is it important? What are they going to do? Now, then things start rolling from there. And as you see, you know, the speculators come in and then there's all this hype. And then, you know, hype can, you know, you have to keep the, the, understanding of the market and the promise that you're shooting for are kind of in line with where the product or the utility is. And if they get too out of whack, then it's like, oh my God, you promised me the moon and this thing sucks and people walk away disappointed. And then the other hand is you, you know, you build this product, but nobody knows about it, then it doesn't really help anybody either. So the two like have to kind of, kind of walk almost, they have to be in parallel with it. It's really hard to do, but I think those two have to be, you know, in, it's like a concert. You have I guess to have your, everybody work out the same just, that exposed, I guess, somewhat of a bias that I may have just recently found in myself that uh, when I think of marketing, I only consider it to be something that is done from a money-driven perspective. But that's not necessarily true. Like, you need, even if you're trying to push an ideology, something that's serving a purpose and you want to help, help you know, maybe better the world by building something that, that does what you think will help better the world, you need marketing associated with that, selling people on those, on those ideas. Whereas most people, when they think of marketing, it's the, it's it's like the offshoot of we're just trying to sell somebody so we can make money. And I, I think when yeah, I was asking I mean, first question, of all, kudos to you. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I think I, you guys I, interrupted each other. Yeah, <laughs> it's a double interrupt. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just that's basically kind of like I just noticed <laughs> that I maybe was thinking of it in that way still, even though I know it exists. I have this somewhat kind of bias in the, in the back of my mind that always feels that way, regardless of whether or not that's not that that's definitely not the purpose of marketing in its grandest scheme. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I applaud you for your self-awareness and uh, I'm glad the double interrupt is not as big of a problem as the double spend problem. So that's good that we have uh, fixed it here. But I think like, you know, I, I tell people like, I get that most people kind of experience marketing, which isn't really marketing. It's more like I'm going to shove this product down your throat until you bet, you know, until you say, okay, I'll take it. Right. Like I sometimes say the difference between sales and marketing is sales. You call them marketing. They call you. Right. Cause when, when marketers really do their job, it means I really understand, you know, what makes Corey and D tick. I really understand like, what is it that your needs are? And if I build a product or a service that meets those needs, even if maybe you weren't even aware of them yourselves, and then I'm like, hey, man, here's this thing. And you're like, oh, my God, where have you been all my life? That's marketing. As opposed to, dude, I am going to, you know, relentlessly show, show this demo to you, pop-ups, blah, blah, blah. That is a form of marketing, and most of us have that. Why? Because most people, I think, don't do the hard part of marketing, which is understand 
the customer, understand what the market need, understand the larger situation. And so they're like, well, I just got to go sell stuff. Or otherwise, my kids are going to die and I'm going to be living under a bridge. So I'm going to shove this down your throat. And, and then eventually like, oh, beg for mercy. Fine. OK, I'll just buy your stuff just to get you to shut up. Like, I get it. I think that and I think you're right. But, you know, to me, the great technologists are can be should be great marketers because they're like, well, I'm not just going to build something because I like it. I'm going to build something because it solves problems that other people actually have. And if I've understood what those problems are, then I'm going to build, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use my technological capabilities to build something for them. But it's hard because most of us have that other experience and I'm not alone in that respect. So let's flip the script a little bit. Let's talk about some current events. Like, um, you know, we know the state of marketing in Bitcoin is going to be kind of bad a little for a little while. I give it another three years before we start to see some, CNN commercials about blockchain and Bitcoin. It'll be pretty neat. You know, there'll be advertising in, in the uh, investment fund commercials that I see. Um, but let's talk about some current events. So recently, SEC said that ICOs can be treated as securities. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask both of these questions the same way about the both bits of news. Good or bad? What do we think? So... Good. It's, I'm going to say, I'm going to take a cheap way out and say both. Like, you know, and also, Boo. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take the under on the three years on you seeing an ad on CNN or CNBC about some blockchain company. I, I bet you it's under three years. And I think, you think so? I do, because I think you're going to, I mean, this thing's happening so quickly. You're going to see like private blockchain, enterprise focused financial services blockchain start to drop ads on CNBC, you know, Morning Joe, stuff like that, or Squawk Box, that kind of thing. Like I wouldn't, so I'll take, you know, we can, we can put a small friendly wager using your sponsor, uh, Bet Kings or whatever. Also, I guess we could do that, right? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, to do better. that, but look, the SEC, thing, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we could throw uh, some percentage of Bitcoin there, you know, at the end in a few years, like, dude, I bet you a hundred thousand dollars on that. That was stupid. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I think the SEC thing is good because to Corey's earlier point about all the speculators, like I think it's going to scare away the total scam artists and the people who are just looking for the let's roll the dice and make as much money. And it's going to make people a little bit more cautious on that respect. I think that's great. Like I want to get those clowns out. I want the people who are really committed to get to the hard work of actually building the practical stuff to, to give us better security, better privacy, you know, lower transaction costs. So I want that. I'm a little bit nervous about the, the innovation implications. Like I think a lot of people are going to say, screw it. I'm not going to deal with the Americans. I'm going to, go to Switzerland or Singapore or Dubai. And then I think that we create a lot of innovation hubs outside of US, which is negative for job growth and, and, and things like that. So it's hard to say, you know, so it's like, you know, we knew this day was coming, but okay, it's here. So I, I, you know, I don't think it's either bad or good. I mean, it's not quite as bad as having Floyd Mayweather, you know, drop in his money on ICOs, but uh, it, nice. it's yeah, you like that segue? I did like it. I appreciated it. I was like, this guy's reading my mind right now. <laughs> yeah. So in case you guys listening don't know, Floyd Money Mayweather, or now we can call him Floyd Crypto Money Mayweather, right? right? Posts a picture on Facebook with what looks to be about, I don't know, maybe a million dollars in cash on a table in a private plane. And there's gold everywhere. Um, but he's wearing pajamas. Don't get that. But <laughs> he's invested in something called Stocks.com. Their ICO is releasing in five days. Uh, most likely it's going to make a lot of money. But it's very interesting. Um, now I'm starting to believe a little bit of um, – I got in this like Twitter thread with Mark Cuban a month ago. Probably highlighted my little life. <laughs> and we were talking about like uh, if crypto was in a bubble. And yet yeah, now I'm sold. This is definitely bubble territory. <laughs> if Floyd Mayweather is investing in ICOs. Here's the thing. So here's the thing. Is he really though? I mean, how much money do they pay him to do that? Like, if you, if as from, from their perspective, dollars. from their perspective, they could basically say, we'll right. give you money to say you're investing in our, in our thing. And if other people see you doing that, that's going to be, especially right now in the hype 
of Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor, a lot of people will see that, which is something that people will pay for in terms of advertising. And that's going to bring a ton of people to throw a lot of dumb money into something because Floyd Mayweather's doing it. Now, you know, speaking of uh, Conor McGregor, like last time, I think you guys, I, I told you that sometimes I get confused for, not confused, sometimes people tell me I look like Bruce Willis, occasionally I get Vin Diesel. Corey, yeah. I feel like yeah. Conor McGregor there. I get it. I get it a lot. Let actually, people know. I get, I get it a lot. Uh, actually, uh, when I lived in Brazil, that was my that was my nickname at the jiu-jitsu gym that I went to. Like, hey, McGregor. Keep... <laughs> Yeah, you been cool. and it, like just, they that. kept going I, on and on. And then I, the other day, I was pumping gas in in Maryland, right in Columbia, Maryland. I was pumping gas, and this guy is like staring at me, and he's looking, he's like laughing with his kids, <laughs> like looking with his kids, and like laughing, and I'm looking back at me and smiling, and looking back at his kids, and he looks at me and kind of nods his head and goes, "Hey, my kids said they love all your fights," and I just just start cracking up laughing. Like I, I'm wearing like like nice work clothes. <laughs> Like I wouldn't say they're nice work clothes. There's nothing compared to what McGregor wears in his fly suits. But I'm like, <laughs> he is a good dress. Yeah. But it never occurred to the dad to be like, "Hey, I don't think Conor McGregor is pumping gas in Columbia, Maryland." Like it just, just. Oh, he whatever. was. Like, he was tipping his cap. He was tipping his cap to me because his kids were freaking out inside of his car. Oh my God! It's Conor McGregor. You know. Yeah. But coming yeah. back to the guys like Floyd Me- Floyd Mayweather, like. What's a little, I mean, look, this stuff happens all the time, but it's frustrating. Like, I don't know if I can do a little bit of a product placement here and full disclosure, like I'm an advisor. So if you guys don't like it, you can beat me up later. But like, I have this, this company I'm, I'm advising. It's their, uh, their, their ICO is coming up in August. It's called the liquid asset token, right? Now, whether they get it done or not, and they're, they're the best ever, like, I don't know. Like, I love the concept. And the concept is like, okay. Let's say, like, for most Americans, like, your single biggest investment is your house, right? And let's say you buy your house, and then you, you know, you owe whatever, you know, it is to the bank. But let's say over time, you, you build up the equity in your house into the point where, let's say, you owe 50%. Of, let's say your house is worth half a million dollars um, or whatever, 300, doesn't matter. And you, you owe half to the bank. But now you have a quarter million dollars in equity that you can't actually touch. So what do most people do? Either they leave it there. Or they take out a home equity line of credit, which basically now you start paying interest on. So what these liquid asset token guys are like, wait a second, what if you were to tokenize your house? And basically then I could issue on the blockchain, you know, tokens that represent, say, 10% of my house. So now I could sell 10% of my house for $25,000. I get the cash and other people who might want exposure to real estate where I live now own a small share of my house. Let's say you're an investor in Brazil or France. You're like, I want the U.S. real estate market, but you can't afford to put in a million dollars. You're like, I could put in $5,000 or whatever. And then let's say in a couple of years, my value of my house appreciates, it doubles or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Now that token, which of course can be traded multiple times. Now let's say the house worth a million dollars just to keep the math simple. Well, now you're 10%. If it went from 25 or 10 percent share went from the 25,000 it doubled basically to 50,000. So now like and I had the cash all along without paying interest. So all these illiquid assets like houses or pieces of art or whatever that are sitting in people's homes that are basically cash. Or if you had a piece of art, you could sell 49 percent of that uh, of that piece of art to other people who want to like buy into this you know up and coming artist or whatever. Now you get the cash, keep the art on the wall, keep your house, and other people get to diversify their portfolio. Like to me, that's a freaking revolutionary concept. It's super awesome. And, you know, whether they, again, I hope they do it because I think that they're pretty cool, but somebody's going to figure it out. But the challenge is in all this noise with Floyd Mayweather like throwing money around, like the really good ideas are oftentimes getting buried and you have to separate the signal from the noise. So, like, that's what's that's what's a little disconcerting to me. So like you could at the same time say a guy like Floyd Mayweather or even the SEC ruling trying to bring it all back together actually slows things down and makes that that future where regular people who should be able to get money from their illiquid assets without having to pay interest on it, you know, that day is now farther off in the future as opposed to closer. And that makes me a little sad because I want people 
Like, I don't want people to be buried in debt. Like, that's a bad thing. I want them to be like, hey, you have this house. Now you have this cash. You still keep the house, and you don't owe anybody any money. Good for you. That's awesome. Sorry, man. The coffee's kicking in, and I just get super That's sick. a pretty good idea, actually. I know. It's an awesome idea, you know? Liquidacetoken.com. There you go. <laughs> like, you should have one of them on the show. Have you talked to one of them about coming on the show? I can definitely get them on the show. The one thing I'll say that's really cool is they're Russian. So the best part for me is living in the in D.C., I get to now tell everybody I'm also working with the Russians. So my street cred goes even higher now. <laughs> or you get a lot of shady better. eyes. You get a lot so, of shady yeah. eyes for some folks. Like, I don't know. But, I got a lot yeah. of shady eyes. Yeah. I can definitely get these guys on the show. They got the strong, solid Russian accent. It'll make it real. But like the even again, it's not – it's not whether these guys particularly can get it done or not. I mean, there's a lot of execution stuff, but the concept that you could take these stuff that's all these assets, whether it's jewelry or art or cars or whatever, that are sitting around that are doing nothing for you, that now you can turn it into cash where you can deploy that cash in more in other ways and investors can now get exposure. I mean, imagine if you're like, hey, I own 0.01% of you know, Paris real estate or Dubai real estate or this up and coming artist who I could never afford his own thing in Soho, but now I own a fractional share. And if it appreciates and you can trade it because it's a free liquid market. We talked anyway, about this. Yeah, we talked I'll get about him this. on the show if you want. But and I think it's going to be uh, in this episode we release on Sunday is is this idea of the what I, ICOs aren't going away. In fact, they're going to get much, much, much worse in the num in the sheer number and volume of them. It, because what it is, it's a decentralized crowdfunding mechanism. And the easier it becomes to do these things, right. the more access you have for every every average age people with a good idea to try and do them. Now, the bar right. that of getting the amount of attention required to make a ton of money is getting higher and higher and higher and higher. So regardless of the fact that we have thousands and thousands of new people trying to do an ICO, they're not getting the requisite attention if they want to raise millions and millions and millions of dollars. Now, I can do an ICO and raise $10,000 amongst my small peer community of the attention that I can get. Good. That's a cool thing. But right. providing liquidity for something like that becomes a different story. Whatever. Move on. But I'm saying that the ICOs aren't going anywhere. But the, because, but the standard of getting the requisite amount of attention to make the real money is getting higher and higher and higher. So that we're still going to see a small amount of things getting through to like getting past the noise to become a signal. And hopefully that bar is getting raised by quality standards. And I think that's what we really need to focus mm. on in the, I guess in the near future is to make sure that the people who are getting through aren't people hiring Floyd Mayweather to take a picture and with a bunch of cash with their name on it. And so instead it's like, we're taking the necessary precautions to make sure that our investors don't get screwed and then mm -hmm. we're going to build the product that actually changes the world. Yeah, you know, it's it's a totally valid point. The one thing I would say is I, I wonder, like, it's the time perspective. Like, right now, it certainly feels that way. But right now, when it's like, hey, we're doing an ICO, to me, that's the 2017 equivalent of what I saw in 98, 99, where it was like, we're going to just chuck .com onto everything. Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So. In that short time frame, you would put .com on anything and people would just give you money for like the most ridiculous things. And then that eventually blew – like that's a house of cards, not the Netflix show, but an actual one. And it falls apart mm -hmm. and you're like, OK. So I wonder if – like we just – like what's so difficult – I have this too is like, hey, can you really play the long game? Can you take this long view and say, look, the trend of decentralization is there. There are going to be charlatans, especially when there's a lot of money to be made. But you know what? Those guys are going to go away, especially because we're so interconnected. We'll figure out who the scam artists are, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the higher quality stuff will kind of e emerge even. And I would almost argue that it's better to raise less money because having you know worked at a company where, we, where I joined when there were 30 people – and we were valued at 20 million to go up to 1,400 people in 1 1.8 billion. And I'll tell you that having less money, it sounds crazy, is actually a good thing. Because it forces you to be really focused on how you, on where you, on where your priorities are, where you put your initiatives, how you develop, how you add value. If you have $150 million, you're like, yeah, sure, we can have seven ping pong tables or whatever it is. Like, it doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. So, like, 
I think there's that. And then I think the, the liquidity things, but that's totally valid, valid because of the decentralized sort of the, the token economics, which is why like a bank core thing is kind of interesting. Like if you had some, if, if their thing works and I'm still trying to get my head around it, but like the idea that you have liquidity, no matter how small yeah. your thing is like, if that actually works, like, you know, I talked to the bank or one of the bank core founders earlier this week, like they're really intense. They're really smart. Like she really golly she, she had a really like just great mind and like i feel like i can't get to the point where i can discount this idea because like there, it feels like there's something there so like if they, they can create that layer or someone like them can create that layer then okay you can start small and then build value without feeling this you know floyd crypto money mayweather pressure yeah i like your saying Corey. i'm going to use it in my book that i never write and that's, <laughs> don't make noise but become a signal i like that did which I say that? Crypto- oh. Yeah, I said that. Think- <laughs> I was going to say, which cryptocurrency do you think if Floyd Money Mayweather became a crypto, would he be like Floyd Monero Mayweather? Would it be Floyd Dash Mayweather? Floyd Zcash? Like, which one do you think he would be? I think he likes gold. I think he'd choose Bitcoin. Really? Yeah. I think he's he all could hype. Be Floyd Dig- Digix with Mayweather, though. I think it's all hype. I have so many. I have a random amount of digits. It's one of those random coins that I own. I don't Floyd know you Thor, Mayweather. You don't see Floyd Filecoin Mayweather. You don't see that one. <laughs> no, I don't. See, <laughs> if quite. anything, Floyd Mayweather would have Floyd Coin. Floyd. That's what it, I I want to hear I want to hear McGregor answer that question because he'd come up with something really ridiculous that would I know make Floyd say, sound like an ass. <laughs> Are we trying to be professional now? I can't say those words. Oh. I know. It's your show, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> no, I, we're trying. We're going pro. Remember, we're trying to oh, not so families can listen to us. That's right. We're <laughs> family friendly now. I yeah. Kind of. Sure. I guess. <laughs> whatever. Well, <laughs> if, if iTunes ever figures out we're not family friendly, not family friendly, and haven't put the adult content tag on our show this whole time. I think you'll know you have had it made when like Disney wants to sponsor the Bitcoin podcast. Like that or wants to sue us. One of those two. <laughs> Either wants to sponsor and, us or sue us. Whichever one yeah. is, is more convenient for them. Good, good news everybody. We're getting sued by Disney. We made it. We made it guys. <laughs> and we're done. That's what you want. You're taking on the man. Yeah. Well I don't think there's anything like one there were a lot of current events. You know, of course, SegWit got a green light temporarily or however this is going. There's a stupid Bitcoin cash thing that I'm reading about. Uh, Roger Vera seems to be tumbling further down some random thing he thinks is a rabbit hole. Um, let's see. There's too much news. We should probably just kind of wrap it up. Well, can I ask you guys a question? It's your show. Yeah. Okay. Let's say we're talking like. You know, I have like I deal with most of the people I deal with have no idea like what crypto is. Like they just look at me like, like Jeremy, what should I do? And even most of them still don't know. But you know, I'm like, just go get some Bitcoin, hold on for five years, like whatever. Like, okay, what do you guys like? How would you handicap sort of this? And like today's July 27th, so we're on the cusp of the August 1st date, and then you know, I think November 1st is like that next big milestone. How, how do you guys sort of like if you had to? If I was saying. You know, you got to put a prediction now. What would you say is the most likely outcome, you know, of this whole kind of thing? Okay. Say January 1 or Jan- six months from now, January 27th. The outcome, in my personal opinion, is we will have one central Bitcoin, the main Bitcoin, the one everyone calls Bitcoin. And the, more, and the, and the vast majority of the people who kind of use it for utility <laughs> and don't have a strong ideology that they're pushing is on a central chain and that's going to be the segwit plus two x chain like it's going to be segwit and then they're going to have a two megabyte hard fork that becomes segwit and you have a two with with a two megabyte block size that's probably in my opinion going to be the main chain in the process of getting there there will be people so like when we do a two megabyte hard fork people will essentially a section or a portion of the people who use the chain before that will break off and create and they'll just continue running their own It'll maybe probably a very small percentage and they'll just continue to push their like push or continue to maintain that side chain because it suits their ideology and they want to have they want to have a vehicle for that ideology. 
The same thing with Bitcoin ABC slash Bitcoin Cash. When people start rejecting the SegWit blocks, they're probably going to fork off into a, it's basically an eight megabyte block size chain that it doesn't accept SegWit blocks. That will still probably be in existence, but will be smaller. It'll be some mining proportion that's probably very centralized and they, they're using it as a vehicle to push their ideology. But in the end of the day, you have one thing called Bitcoin that everyone uses that's still kind of the staple of getting things done and building things on top of. Gotcha. And right. that's my kind of short um, way of, of viewing this. And there are chances that those side chains won't even exist because people don't use them. <laughs> the, like the, the, the vehicle wasn't strong enough to carry the ideology and they'll start and they'll kind of come back onto the main chain or they try to do something else to disrupt the status of the main chain. And in the process of all of this, you know, during that six month period, prices are probably going to go wild because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, a lot of sentiment manipulation, a lot of hype, a lot of, you know, people getting misinformation and things like that. But eventually, I, in my opinion, there will be one true winner and it'll probably just be the one that everyone's using because they don't care about I, the reason for using it. I think that humans like patterns and humans like cycles. So I think that this is going to, if it keeps going the direction it's headed, we're going to get Bitcoin classic, some form of it with a different name. And then we're going to get Bitcoin just kind of like we have Ethereum and Ethereum classic. Mm. I think the model's been set and no matter what the circumstances of the Ethereum split were, um, Bitcoin, if there's a split, it's probably going to follow that same model. Um, so own your private keys and you'll get a little boost. You'll get a little boost because you're going to have a Bitcoin classic and a Bitcoin that everyone uses, the one that Corey just outlined. Mm. Um, but the point, there's a lot of money in this. So if they want to split off and they want to have their own little Bitcoin, then they have the money and they probably have some hash power to make it so good for them. It's probably not going to go away. But in all honesty, I'd rather them fork off and do their own thing. And I did mean that as a pun. So <laughs> um, I'd rather that happen. Uh, I think that's what's going to happen. It's just going to be a repeat of history. Everybody's going to feel comfortable with Ethereum Classic like we are now. Like for some random reason, Ethereum Classic is like just below $20 per. And I happen to have a bunch of them for when it's split. Yay me. I had the private keys. But... You know, just that's just the way it is. So, all right, well, that's 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 comfort. I, I, yeah, I'm with you. That that that's good. The only the only issue with this show is uh, you're the only one D not wearing a Bitcoin shirt. I feel like that needs to be fixed. Oh, you well, it's like those Mayweather suits. Actually, it says Bitcoin in these little white oh, okay. horizontal My, stripes. You had that. It was, get real, we could sell those. You got to get real make close. a ton of money. That whole shirt is actually <laughs> a QR code. <laughs> just got to get close. That's all. Cool. Um, all right, Jeremy. Well, I think we can wrap up. Yeah. Good show. Once again, I think me. we're gonna we have to do this just for just to keep our keep our namesake in ten words I think or less. People like these shows. Can you explain? Blockchain? It would be nice to know if people really like these shows. I like them. You guys seem to like them. But do our customers, our listeners, like them? Sure. It's actually not mine. Our yours i should i don't want to take over take over you're part of the community you're You're part of the community now it's your show too oh no look at that open source decentralized ownership community but i Corey asked the question question. but i think we bombarded yeah you just ignored the hell out of me (laughs) i asked you a question jeremy that's because i i i interrupted you that's why hard what was the question in 10 words or less can you describe blockchain once again you when did you ask me that uh, y'all were talking, and I just talked. And no one heard me. Yeah, I interrupted him terribly. Oh no, I, like, we've also I right also you asked you that probably every time you've been on the show. So I'm curious, what's your uh, what's your answer this time? I just I was gonna say like I think the fact that you're in this like rural New York hotel is hurting us with this like lag thing or wherever you are. Probably. I don't know, but Airbnb. maybe rural. I don't know. Airbnb, whatever. Uh, ten words or less. How do I describe blockchain? That's the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I basically say it's, I don't know if I, I got to have to count the words. Now I'm feeling very nervous. A lot of pressure. I, feel I got you like, covered. I got well, you covered. 
What I feel like right now is there was that one episode of Chris DeRose's uh, Bitcoin uh, show where he like where he asked somebody who shall remain nameless, and then he just went to town on him slash her. Uh, so, but it's okay. That's all right. Um, I usually say that it's um, imagine everyone has a copy of a Google Sheet, and it's not controlled in one central place. It's all uh, you know. Um, on on your computer, and then therefore maintaining the integrity of the data is extremely um, uh, um, it's easier to do. It's less costly, less costly, or it's more cost effective. And you use this pretty cool, like proof of work, usually um, cryptographic algorithm to um, keep everything secure. So e easy to add stuff to near impossible to modify and edit that was like 10 100 words but yeah you, you, you roughly... put it the 10 10 word limit <laughs> yeah you destroyed that but you hit it on the head with the last 10 words easy to modify impossible to edit that Hell, was... sorry man i was up till four in the morning doing this freaking ebook i don't have my a game right now guys <laughs> sorry it's been rough man it's know. all good we'll now, paraphrase now now they're going to flame me and be like, get that joker off your show. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, finally, someone's exposed me for the fraud that I am. I can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be on a Reddit on a Reddit post. Jeremy FC. Exposed on the big one. <laughs> exactly. Totally exposed for once. All right, guys. Well, let's let's, let's call real. it a day. Always fun. Always fun to have you on the Thanks, show. Thanks, guys. Man. Appreciate it. It's an honor. You guys are a ton of fun. I appreciate it. You do good work. Play the outro. <laughs>